Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this webinar is called The Spirit of Harm Reduction, a toolkit for communities of faith confronting overdose. You can go on out to the next one. So this is brought to you by National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, from Faith and Harm Reduction, um, and in connection with um, National Harm Reduction Coalition, this here is um, from our North Star, which is a model that you know we use to drive the work that we do. And it goes, National Harm Reduction Coalition creates space for dialogue and action that help heal the harms caused by racialized drug policies. Um, and a little bit of what National Harm Reduction does is we're responsible for policy and advocacy. Um, we go to the state um, capital and do a lot of um, advocating for different funding and um, um, for our communities. Um, we're responsible for national and regional conferences. Um, this year, our conference was supposed to be in San Juan, but because of COVID, it was postponed to 2022. Um, and then we'll be in San Juan, um, Puerto Rico also. Um, we're responsible for training with technical assistance. Um, we also help agencies become um, opioid overdose prevention programs, um, allowing them to distribute um, Narcan and Naloxone to um, marginalized communities. And on our website, um, we also have resources and publications that you can um, download or purchase from us. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so we're just going to go over a um, couple of Zoom housekeeping um, rules. Um, so on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, um, you get the option to call in. Um, on the, the arrow pointing up next to the um, telephone icon, um, you click it and it gives you the option, um, depending on your regional code, it gives you a number to dial in and you dial in our meeting ID and you'll be in. This will help you hear better if you have choppy internet service like me. Um, next slide, please. Um, also, um, feel free to use the um, chat drop box. Um, if you want to introduce yourself, make sure that the drop box stays everyone. Um, rather than um, a specific person, because only that person will see it. But then also, um, it also you can message people um, directly, um, you know, to say hello or whatever the case may be. Also, on your um, right next to the phone icon, you have your the camcorder icon, and that allows you to turn yourself on or off from um, video. Next slide, please. Yes, and also, you know, if you like what you're hearing, you can also use your reaction, uh, thumbs up, hand clap. Um, also, you can change the options. Let me click. So where where the where the images are, you drag your mouse over to it, and a, on the far left hand side, it gives you options um, to change from speaker view, gallery view. It allows you to see everybody that's in this. Um, webinar right now, um, or I think it's four boxes. It lets you see four boxes at one time, um, whatever you prefer. Next slide, please. And just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded um, and it will be shared with um, our participants today. Um, so with it being recorded, anything that you write in the chat box, whether it's private or a general um, statement, it, it, we can see it in the transcript afterwards. Um, also, use the chat drop box to, you know, any questions you might have for our, um, our panelists, um, anything you want to say to them to also use the chat box. Um, also, um, just so everybody could have clarity on what everybody is saying, you know, try to um, make sure that you're muted, you know, um, if there's a chance where you are talking, um, just remember afterwards to um, mute yourself um, so we don't hear, you know, like the background noise and yeah. Next slide. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Erica for a meditation. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jose. I don't know if folks can hear me or see me. Oh, now I can see me. So I'm assuming you can as well. Thank you so much. And thank you to each of, uh, each of you for joining us here this afternoon. My name is Erica Paulette and I am the Director of Faith and Community Partnerships with the National Harm Reduction Coalition and am the Founder and Director of Faith and Harm Reduction. Um, in the spirit of our gathering, I want to begin with an invitation to connection connection to the land on which you are present, connection to those who have come before and will come after, and connection to your own self, to the collective gathered here together to explore ways to deepen justice and liberation in partnership with people who use drugs. So I invite you to find a comfortable seated or standing position while we take a minute to root ourselves. Close your eyes if you are comfortable or lower your gaze to the floor in front of you. And take th three slow, deep breaths. With each exhale, imagine that you are breathing out all the noise and worry, all the things that want your attention in this moment Allow yourself this short span of time to just relax, to be free. Continue to breathe slowly, deeply. Concentrate on feeling your feet. See if you can feel the place where your feet meet the ground, feeling the solidity that is yours, the ground that is holding you, that is holding us. If you know the name of the people on whose land you are gathered, invite them in by saying their names. I am gathered on the unceded land of the Lenape and Wappinger people. I acknowledge these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. I acknowledge that the land I am gathered on was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. May this acknowledgement be a commitment to continuing the work to dismantle the legacies of colonialism and white supremacy. As we keep breathing slowly, deeply, keeping a hovering focus on your breath, your feet, on the ground, finally bring your attention to your whole body. Let your awareness cover your entire self at once. Feel yourself breathing as we finish together with sleep three slow breaths. As you are ready, feel free to allow yourselves to gently return to the space, open your eyes, look around this virtual gathering. I'm not sure if you can see others in this space, but thank yourself for this practice. I thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We are thrilled to welcome you to the launch of the Spirit of Harm Reduction Toolkit and more broadly, Faith and Harm Reduction. For those who are not familiar with Faith and Harm Reduction, we are a collaborative project of the National Harm Reduction Coalition and Judson Memorial Church in New York City, a member congregation of the United Church of Christ. As a national collective of faith and community leaders, we mobilize spirit, connection, and power in partnership with people who use drugs. We were born of the understanding that there was a call to build bridges between harm reduction and faith communities in order to develop leadership, strengthen harm reduction advocacy efforts, and build environments supportive of harm reduction policies and practices. Next slide, please. As a collective, we have arrived at the following mission which guides the spirit of our work. Faith and harm reduction co-creates a justice movement which connects people who use drugs, people who do sex work, and communities of faith through the development of harm reduction centered spiritual resources, ritual support, and spiritual care. The spirit of harm reduction toolkit, like all of our efforts, has been very much a work of love and was made possible by an incredible collective of contributors who hail from a range of spiritual traditions, practices, and those with none, with a shared belief in the capacity of harm reduction as a movement for liberation. Next slide, please. We have an incredible roster of panelists today, and the conversation will be led by Reverend Sarah Hal Miller and Jose Martinez from National Harm Reduction Coalition. Our panelists will include Reverend M. Barkley from Enfleshed, Blythe Barnow from Faith in Public Life and Feminary, 
Terrell Jones with the New York Harm Reduction Educators, Vocal New York and the Peer Network of New York. Marilyn Reyes from Vocal New York and the Peer Network of New York. Jess Cochran with the Never Alone Project and Katie Simon with Urban Survivors Union and Whose Corner Is It Anyway? Following the panelists, there will be a time for questions and answers, and we will wrap up our time together with a closing, which will be led by Reverend M. Barkley. In addition to toolkit contributors, the support of organizations such as Open Society Foundations and New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene were invaluable in seeing this project come to life. However, the biggest thank you is owed to the Faith and Harm Reduction's National Leadership Collective, who vision and shape our movement building, and the folks who comprise this fabulous team are Jose Martinez, Marilyn Reyes, Reverend Sarah Hal Miller, Blythe Barnell, Terrell Jones, Reverend Dr. Arisha Bowers, Elizabeth Brewington, Michelle Mathis, Reverend M. Barkley, Jess Tilly, Louise Vincent, Albie Park, Malika Lamont, Katrina Johnson, Kimberly Buck, Robert Suarez, Nina Strakartz, and Dr. Andrew Bell. This toolkit is very much a reflection of their spirit, their love, and their commitment to our co collective belief that liberation is possible together, so thank you. And to all of you joining us in this movement here today, we welcome you. And with this, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah, to start us off. Thank you so much, um, Jose and Erica. So I'm going to give a very brief overview of the Spirit of Harm Reduction Toolkit for faith communities, communities of faith facing overdose. And this is going to be a very quick overview. This um, is a, a substantial resource with a lot in it. And I do hope that you'll um, take some time to explore it. Um, what Some of what I'll be showing you is um, screenshots of the PDF version of the toolkit, but there's also an online version of the resource, and I'll share that link um, in the chat when I get a get a moment after um, showing these slides. But uh, to get a sense of why we felt like a toolkit for this particular purpose was important. So first, to help faith leaders understand the issues and lead faith communities in becoming better allies to people who use drugs and people who do sex work. Uh, there are often very good intentions among uh, faith communities, but uh, a deeper understanding and, um, and, and listening more to people with direct lived experience is something that um, I think uh, a lot of communities of faith can grow in. And I say that as an ordained uh, minister myself. Uh, to foster concrete support for local harm reduction work, both on the ground and in terms of policy awareness and change. To resource faith communities and in incorporating stigma reducing language into ritual, education, outreach, and more. And to support harm reductionists with a resource for engaging with faith leaders in the course of their organizing. And we are really leaning into the beautiful messiness that is um, seeking to uh, reach out both to harm reductionists and people who use drugs and people who do sex work and to faith communities, recognizing that those audiences often overlap but often are. Um, different in their approach and understanding, but we embrace that and um, want to dig into that more and are grateful for y'all being here today to participate in that. So just an overview of the, what the toolkit does. The Faith and Harm Reduction Toolkit makes the case for why faith communities need harm reduction. It educates on issues related to substance use and racialized drug policy. The, the educational piece is not comprehensive, but is designed to be introductory to a lot of these, these issues. Uh, it provides diverse ritual resources, it stories the harm reduction movement with sermons, personal narratives, poetry, and more, and gives faith communities concrete action steps to supporting harm reduction practices and policies. And today, as our speakers um, uh, address you, there will be folks who are um, uh, both presenting some of their ritual resources as well as just talking about why such resources are important in this movement. And then we'll get to hear from some of the folks whose stories are involved in what we call the Voices of Harm Reduction section of the toolkit. Just a note about this resource that it is a living document. We're um, hoping to continue to have it evolve and grow as this movement grows. Uh, one thing, the initial uh, version of this toolkit was uh, focused largely on overdose and um, we're hoping to expand some of the resources there, uh, but a lot of a lot of the work that you'll see is, is sort of uh, just beginning really to dig it in. So we hope that you'll join us on this journey of learning and growing. 
Uh, the toolkit starts by by uh, making the case for why we're here and and setting the table. And we have um, uh, Erica, who spoke earlier, lay, lays out sort of the moral problem and why the question of overdose and of stigma against people who use drugs and people who do sex work is something that communities of faith need to be concerned with and need to address. We also do some just basic laying out of what is harm reduction. And we um, say that harm reduction is both a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use and a movement for social justice built on a belief in and a respect for the rights of people who use drugs. And we talk more about how that ties in specifically with um, communities of faith. We also have an invitation to action and um, uh, outlines of specific harm reduction services and what those can look like, which there's a wide variety of the material kinds of support that harm reduction can offer. Do so a little bit of education on the substance use spectrum, which uh, sort of uh, embraces both um, abstinence as not being opposed to harm reduction, but as being a part of the spectrum and it not being either or, that everyone has their own journey when it comes to substance use, and that it's important for folks who want to be allies to understand and support people on that. Uh, also just address some um, resources around understanding opioid and opioid overdose, as well as um, uh, use and overdose on other kinds of drugs as well. We have some resources and guidelines for establishing a plan for responding to overdose in your place of worship and, uh, and training on how to respond to an overdose. We uh, advocate for all communities of faith and places of worship to have naloxone, the over opioid overdose reversal drug on hand, and to have people trained in understanding how to recognize and respond to opioid overdose um, in, in your, on your property or in um, events that you may be holding, which we recognize is a little different these days during COVID. Uh, we also try to uh, outline medications for opioid use disorder and give a brief intro to the relationship between racism and drug policy. Obviously, that is a huge topic, so we just uh, barely scratched the surface there, but it's important. As uh, Jose read our uh, North Star statement for the National Harm Reduction Coalition, we think it's always important to center that in conversations around substance use and overdose. Um, we try. We really believe that one of the big things that communities of faith can do to support harm reduction efforts is to work to change uh, the way that stigma is um, upheld and, and perpetuated. We uh, recognize that communities of faith have often been um, guilty of perpetuating stigma even without intending to and um, offer some suggestions for ways that communities of faith can take the lead in shifting some of the language and behavior and assumptions that contribute to stigma, which we know that stigma can um, and is deadly to, um, to people who use drugs and people who do sex work. So this is, uh, when we talk about language, it's not about being politically correct, it is about saving lives. We also have a host of spiritual and ritual resources from um, having questions for a faith community co to consider how to be better allies to people who use drugs, how to offer sanctuary, um, many different pr prayers and blessings that uh, uh, Reverend M. Barclay and Blythe Barnow will talk with us a little bit more about in a bit. Um, different rituals that can be part of, uh, say, an overdose awareness day or a ceremony for remembering folks who are lost and both uh, both remembering folks lost to overdose and upholding the resilience of the communities um, that prevent overdose on a daily basis. And, uh, and then finally, our, we, our, the bulk of our section is this Voices of Harm Reduction section where we uplift um, personal stories of, of people who, both um, faith leaders, people who use drugs, people who do sex work, and other harm reductionists to give more of a uh, personal face, uh, put, a, put a face to this uh, whole conversation. So we have a um, series of sermons. We have interviews with some of the folks who are uh, going to be speaking with you in a minute. We have poetry and um, uh, letters. And here's another couple of samples of uh, titles of, of, um, of interviews and articles that we have in the toolkit that represent some of these voices. And you'll be hearing from well, I, myself, and three of these, all of these people you'll be hearing from today. We also at the end have uh, ways to respond in action and concrete ways for 
communities of faith to extend hospitality, to build community, to participate in advocacy, and to offer compassionate care to people who use drugs. So I know that that was a complete whirlwind, but I want to make sure we give time for all of our speakers. So we're going to um, pause right there, and I'm going to pass it off to M and Blythe to talk about um, spiritual and ritual resourcing. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. And hello, everybody. My name is M. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the director of an organization called Enfleshed, where we create spiritual resources uh, to serve nourishment for the work of collective liberation. Um, and before I pass this over to Blythe, I uh, wanted to speak a little bit to why we believe ritual is a very valuable part of um, the work of harm reduction and sustaining um, sustaining our spirits in the midst. Uh, ritual comes with a lot of baggage for a lot of us. Um, it has a lot of complex histories, uh, especially for those for whom religious rituals have done harm. Um, and ritual uh, nonetheless has a very simple meaning. Uh, ritual is an intentional practice of attention. There are ways that we direct our own attention bodily attention, spirit attention, collective attention to what really needs our focus. Rituals ground us in the truths of our communities to quickly rushed by, forgotten or erased, whether that community of belonging that we claim is religious or political or social, a lineage of harm reductionists, our bonds to the earth and its creatures or practitioners of a given spirituality. Ritual can be as simple as intentionally watering a plant with gratitude for all that gives us life and breath, or rituals can be as complex as the melding of ancient practices and traditions of communities across the centuries, rich in power or deadening in their lifelessness. Ritual at its best can be a subver subversive practice that draws our attention to the people, the places, the feelings, the rememberings that build power within us and between us. Power to heal, power to mourn, power to organize, power to name the truths about what and who takes life away and where it is being nurtured. Ritual at its best can be a practice of resistance. Queer Jewish anarchist Marla Brett Schneider talks about ritual as a way to practice the world we are trying to build together, not in an escapist sense of an otherworldly world or any utopian sense of striving for a life without struggle, but in a way that recognizes we all need to practice revolution or harm reduction or resistance in small, ordinary ways over and over again for these things to grow in any larger sense. We are like children who learn through play and performance. We too need venues for trying out and trying on new ways of being and feeling in our bodies and spirits what it could feel like to do something differently than we have learned. Ritual in this context that gathers us here today is a chance to intentionally practice living in this world where the war on drugs, the criminalization of drugs, drug use and sex work anti-blackness, capitalism, transphobia, poverty, and all the other violences are, that are stripping life from our communities and spirits, where we can intentionally practice living honestly in the world as it is. Ritual allows us different ways of naming the truths that need naming, celebrating, grieving, and repeating truths about the role of Christian supremacy in the war on drugs, truths about the anti-blackness that created it, truths that explicitly correct the lies told about sex workers and people who use drugs. Rituals provide ways of honoring the lives of those who are no longer with us by remembering them and practicing the gifts they left us with, learning from the lessons of their lives, wonder and struggle, ways of paying attention to what harm we have done or endured and or endured, and practicing in word, body, or resource sharing something else that mends. Rituals can teach us how we sit with others' pain without trying to solve it or make it pretty. Celebrating the things that help people survive when survival is discouraged. 
There isn't just room for these things in the world. We have to create the space for them. And rituals can be a part of this. They help us name the real world we are living in today, which Blythe is going to speak to further. Thanks. Um, I love this conversation. It's my favorite conversation. Um, so I'm Blythe Barno, pronouncer she, her. I live in central Ohio and I spend my days mostly working um, at the intersection of faith and harm reduction, building power with people who use drugs and grassroots harm reductionists, um, and also uh, building connection and relationship with faith leaders and communities of faith um, all across the state. I see Alexis just commented, and I'm in a brand new house, which I'm very happy about. Um, and we build power uh, together. So we bring those communities together to advocate for a, a new world and offering spiritual resources, um, but also creating um, change, political change, policy change, uh, to change the realities on the ground. And part of, um, you know, why uh, ritual is so important and spoke so beautifully to it uh, is because it offers us a glimpse of a new world. Uh, and part of how we do that, it, how we get to that glimpse of a new world is by respecting and honoring the one we're already in. So I think of it in, in this way of if you don't, um, in my work with folks, if I don't tend to the grief first, the rage first, the anger first, uh, I don't get to the vision. You have to tend to what is real, what is present, what people are struggling with right now, what people are maybe excited about right now in order to open up heart space, brain space, soul space um, to envision a new way together. And ritual is a really uh, profound space where that can happen. And it's a really useful tool uh, not just for spiritual sustenance, but for movement building, uh, because it creates that space for vision. And when I work with uh, folks who use drugs and, and faith leaders, uh, where I see folks get tripped up a lot is on this reality piece. Because a lot of faith leaders, uh, and I'm in covenant with United Church of Christ, graduated seminary, am lazy about filling out ordination paperwork, but I'll get there someday. Um, and so, you know, I really straddle these worlds in my own life. Um, and I see faith leaders, especially in Ohio, a state that has been hit so hard um, by overdose fatalities. Uh, I see faith leaders struggling to make sense, struggling to speak about this from the pulpit, struggling to um, be faithful in their communities, but they're telling a story and they're not investing in reality. And what I hear so often from people who use drugs and um, you know, both people who use drugs who long for space that respects them in the institutional church and people who want nothing to do of it, with it because it's been so harmful. What I hear is they don't know. Also, I cuss and it's part of my ministry. So, um, <laughs> you know, the people are like, yeah, faith leaders don't know what the fuck they're talking about. What, how they talk about this issue does not reflect my reality. It's stigmatizing, it is damaging, and it's silly. Like a lot of the time it's just silly and doesn't make any kind of sense. And what there is such longing for is a space to reflect the reality of people's experiences. A space where people who use drugs and people in, who are engaged in sex worth can have access to spiritual care that reflects and respects their reality. And that means having to sit in the nuance of people's lives a little more than we do. It means having to step outside of the guidelines of our denomination. I I'm pr work predominantly in Christian spaces uh, and see what's really going on and being willing to tailor ritual space uh, to the person that is sitting in front of us and being able to create ritual, um, you know, on their terms and not just what is in our book of worship, you know, in the same way in the UCC, it's a, you know, we say God is still speaking and don't put a comma or uh, don't put a period where God put a comma. Our book of worship, that's not it. Imagine if that was the only ritual that we ever got to create. 
Boring snooze fest. Most of us don't even like the kind of ritual that is in there. We are being asked to be more imaginative and more faithful. We are being asked to sit in the boldness of what God wants for us and what people deserve. And so when we respect reality, some of how that can look is um, being able to speak in a way that is real and blunt and not coded, not being like, oh, well, you know, they've been lost to the struggle of blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, what is really happening? What's really happening in that person's life? And I think of it for the faith leaders on the call. If you ever had to do CPE, clinical pastoral education, or you had to ever serve as a chaplain, um, often you have to think on your feet and you have to respond to what is in front of you and you have to make whatever is happening sacred. And we have those skills, but we're not employing them in this area. Another, uh, another space is, uh, you know, a lot of faith leaders are having to bury people, bury far too many people, not just because of overdose, because of infection, because of police violence, because of all the many harms um, of the drug war. And in our, in our services, uh, I see it lean two ways. One, we, we lie either by omission or expressly about how that person lost their life, or we lift it up as, as suffering and we turn that person into kind of a martyr. You know, where it's like, they were an incredible child and, and we, paint, we have to lift up um, everything good about them. And I think it comes from a good place but what ends up happening is reality isn't being reflected. And it leaves people in the pews to struggle with what, what their sense of reality is. And it makes them feel alone. And so part of how I uh, think of this is in Christian tradition, we, we talk about how we are called to unconditional love and unconditional love looks a lot like justice. And for me, in the process of grieving, I, I invite us to think about what unconditional grief looks like, meaning that a person deserves to be grieved fully, wholly, and lovingly with all of the complexity and fullness of their life, and that the struggles don't undermine the strengths, that it, paint, it paints a more beautiful and complicated uh, picture. So some of the resources in the toolkit kind of speak to that. Um, and, and I just invite you when you're thinking about creating resources um, and rituals of just making sure that you're telling the truth. And if you don't know, you're allowed to say you don't know what the truth is. And you can open that up to the support of the holy, the sacred, to God, however you, you frame that. Uh, and I also just want to remind that ritual is not just about death. Ritual enlivens and honors life. And it is simple things like M said, you know, sometimes when I talk about ritual, it's like maybe you're creating this whole beautiful intricate altar where each piece has this special meaning, or maybe it's just the part of your dresser where you put everything you love. Maybe that's the altar too. So when we think about what ritual care we can offer, it's not only at funerals. People deserve to have all the moments of their life respected, whether that is, uh, you know, kind of sacred moments uh, like weddings or um, baptisms or any of those kinds of things. Uh, and they deserve to be able to access that spiritual care without sacrificing their dignity. Because some folks, like I said, want to stay outside of the system and they're, they're asking for something new to be created. And some folks are just cre asking for a, a safe space to access old rituals that have been taken from them. Because ritual is another thing that the drug war has stolen. Sacred space is another thing that the drug war has stolen. And people deserve access to spiritual care and anything that helps them to survive and thrive. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to pass it back to M, and we're going to kind of talk a little about agency in general. These are kind of like two touchstones when you're thinking about creating ritual. Does it honor reality? And does it increase a sense of spiritual, emotional, or practical agency in that person's life? So 
Thanks, Clyde. Yeah, I won't add too much more, um, but I will share some words of a friend that I think are really helpful, especially for, so I come from a Christian context as well, especially for, for white clergy um, who are wanting to be in solidarity to remember that uh, practices of solidarity are not to be confused with caretaking, which often withholds agency. Um, uh, practices of solidarity create genuine space for people to practice their own agency. Um, and uh, that difference um, is one that is relational, material, um, it matters significantly, uh, and it means listening, it means asking people what, what feels supportive and what doesn't, and changing things based on people's answers. It means putting your ego aside um, when it is in conflict with what somebody else um, says is helpful for expressing their own agency. Um, it means being willing. I love, Blythe, that you mentioned the like being willing to, to do things outside of what denominational structures um, even require, it means being willing to, to pay consequences for, for actually practicing solidarity. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And just to offer an example, as, as we kind of close out this section, um, you know, one of the ways that ritual looks like in my work and, uh, and is kind of set to increase agency is we have a naloxone safe service. It's a worship service. And part of what we do is uh, we make sure that we honor the local harm reduction leaders who are there by inviting them if they're interested and willing to serve as a liturgist. Because part of what um, this toolkit does, part of what this movement does is really respecting the spiritual leadership that people who use drugs, harm reductionists, people engaged in sex work offer our communities. And for me, there is this sense of um, translation that happens for me, where when we talk about dignity, that like spark in us of enoughness, I really think of that as the spark of the divine. And harm reductionists honor and fan the flames of that spark in people every single day, which means that they are helping people access what is divine in them every single day. And they're powerful ministers and they deserve our respect and our support. And part of what we do when, when folks serve as liturgists is we distribute naloxone um, through faith communities with uh, local harm reduction leaders serving as liturgists. Uh, and people are invited to come and take as many kits as they need, no questions asked. Uh, and afterwards, we all, we all bless the kits all together. And I live in a state where most public health departments, if they distribute naloxone to the community at all, uh, will give you one kit and you have to fill out about three pages of paperwork in order to get that kit. So part of what we are doing through ritual is showing an example of what could be possible. To say that our faith is rooted in generosity and justice. And so come and take all of that, what you need plus some. Uh, and that that is our commitment as faith leaders, even if the laws in our county say that we can't do that, even if our denominational bodies say that we can't do that, um, that that is what our faith calls us to, that is what God calls us to, and that is how we'll choose to move through the world in solidarity with people through action. I think that's it for us and our part. Any other last thoughts, Em? So glad to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, Em and Blythe. That was incredible. Um, I believe we have Terrell Jones up next. Terrell, I haven't located you on our Zoom yet. If you pipe up, I can uh, spotlight you. All right, maybe we can, I know Terrell was having some technical difficulties. Um, Jess or Marilyn, would you guys, would one of y'all like to go? Whatever works for y'all. How about you go ahead, Jess? 
Cool. Um, well, hey, everybody. Um, I didn't know I was going to like lead the little voices section. Um, so uh, my name is Jess Cochran, uh, pronouns they, them. I'm in Indianapolis. I'm the executive director of the Never Alone Project, which is Indy's grassroots uh, harm reduction agency. And um, I will admit um, being asked even to contribute anything to a faith and harm reduction toolkit from the get-go uh, was, was an initial, I guess, confusion for me. But it's really been an honor and a pleasure um, to have an, an outside of Christian or even monotheistic um, vantage point um, included in something. So uh, A, thanks for having me. But B, um, I'm sat yesterday with folks and I was thinking, you know, what is it? that I can say that I have like these five minutes of time, right? Um, and I asked if everybody wanted to hear more about chaos, uh, which is what I wrote about. And then I realized that I already said stuff about that and I'm trying to be intentional about speaking my piece one time. Um, so you can find all of the things, uh, some of the things about uh, chaos and how it relates to harm reduction and also um, my practice as somebody who keeps uh, old ancestral religion. Um, but then I sat and I thought, you know, that's kind of not the end of it for us. So that uh, I want to talk to you about just quickly um, as kind of like a jumping off uh, point. So, or a finishing point, I don't know. Um, so what we know is harm reductionists and uh, especially as folks that are doing boots on the ground work, right? Is that often a lot of the things that we deal with are, they're me it's messy stuff. It's stuff people don't want to talk about. It's stuff people don't want to look at. Um, it's certainly not pretty enough to go inside any of the churches that I grew up going to with like the stained glass windows and like the stuff you're not supposed to touch, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's messy in ways that we're not always prepared to deal with because they seem personally messy, right? Um, and we look at that and it, it is, it's, it's chaotic. But the processes that, that we work with people um, and walk with people uh, through, I suppose, around sometimes, um, chaos is really the gatekeeper for all of those processes, right? We're talking about dealing with structural inequities. We're talking about dismantling white supremacy. We're talking about figuring out housing. We're talking about unpacking trauma, right? Like these are all spaces for which chaos like holds the way and coming from a, a heathen perspective that chaos is it's inevitable right it's part of this cycle through which change happens um but then i started thinking and i remember that in some faith traditions there's an idea that once we get to this good point that it stops and we can sit there and in the stories that were given to me and that I give to my children, when we sit there, everything falls apart because we're not paying attention to it and we're not stewarding ourselves and our space and our people anymore. Um, and so that good, that good place, that balance um, that we want, it's not sustainable ever. Like it's just reality it doesn't really work like that, right? And so I kind of just wanted to also stick the idea in your mind that that chaos, it's serving a purpose and that balance happens, period. So there's an invitation in what I wrote to lean into that chaos as other faith leaders, as, as people that are, you know, hold space um, for spiritual ritual as as churches as synagogues right to lean into that inevitable uneasiness and messiness that can be working alongside people who use drugs and people who are engaged in sex work right but understanding that that chaotic nature it's that's a process through which that any positive change that we talk about in harm reduction can even begin to occur so it's not just chaos that you get to lean into and like learn to live with, which like I would recommend. Learn, living with a little bit of chaos is, is pretty healthy. It's like living with a little bit of dirt. It like builds your immunity to bullshit, right? But understand that all of that chaos that you might have to lean into and as uneasy as it makes you feel 
there's like a whole beautiful new thing coming and it's going to be different. And the balance that that chaos leads into, it might not look the way you want it to, but it will be the way it is and it will be calm and it will be okay until the next chaotic whatever happens, right? But <laughs> that's the fun part about cycles. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of at least like where my, my traditions, that's of course, you know, those of us that keep uh, old ways is not uh, a monolith. So there's all sorts of folks that could have other, other pieces to add to this. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, seeing those, those ties in with harm reduction and, and the, the ways that we minister or care for spiritually um, folks. I don't know, I'm losing my own train of thought. There was chaos also brewing right up in here. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Shoot me a line if you've got questions about how that works or um, if you're harm reduction um, adjacent or practicing harm reduction and, and these are kind of the same sorts of spiritual ways that you're keeping, I would love to like have resources for all of us really to be thinking about how we show up in spaces and what our um, commitments to uh, ourselves and our traditions and, and, and what that means. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it back over. Thank you so much, Jess. I think we're gonna have Marilyn Reyes now, Marilyn. I think you're muted. Now? Hello? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, from my belief from growing up were very punitive when it came to religion, church, and there was a lot of stigma, judgment, that eventually when I got into, into some kind of trouble, I kind of leaned away because it was going to be more punitive than I felt any kind of love or help that I would get. So that was my, my remembering as lit growing up in church. So eventually I just left the church and I, um, I had gone through some traumatic experiences as um, being molested as a little girl. And then when I was raped as a young adult, that's what led me to drug use. Cause that was like the icing on the cake. It just, I had nowhere to turn to. The church wasn't really supportive. Um, family lived with secrets. So I couldn't, you know, everything was hush, hush. You can't talk about it. And, you know, I never helped heal from it because I wasn't allowed to speak on it. And going to therapy wasn't an option because it was like, that was very, something we didn't talk about. Everything was like, keep it secret, keep it quiet. We ain't talking about that. So all that what led me to my experiences with drugs, being incarcerated. And then when I came home um, in 1997, I was looking for different options in my life to find some place where I could fit in. I tried many things, um, asked abstinence, NA meetings, AA meetings, you know, I tried so much, but I always felt like I belonged somewhere else. And then I found harm reduction. Somebody just mentioned to me, go to um, the harm reduction place over there in Manhattan. And I'm like, what the hell is harm reduction? So, you know, it took me like another two years to go because I, I didn't understand it. So eventually I got there. And um, the first thing I did was like, I was welcome. I was um, taken to this room. They introduced me to acupuncture. I mean, I'm, these people are really nice, but you know, I still didn't understand the whole concept yet. So as I started learning about how you get embraced as a whole person and you have different options, it's not just about you need to do this or you're going back to prison, you need to do this or this is bad, all these bad things are going to happen. No, this place just embraced me, educated me, taught me how to, it became my lifestyle. I live harm reduction. I breathe it. I share it with the world. And it's become part of, I could say it's my religion because I always believed that God was loving, caring and accepting me the way I am no matter what. 
So that's what harm reduction is to me. And once um, Eric introduced me to faith and harm reduction, I just, I just would jump in because I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I found my place in my spirituality again, which was amazing because I felt I, I had gotten lost from that. But harm reduction reintroduced me to it. Just I didn't know it at first, but it just led me that on that path. And I'm doing God's work now. Like for me, this is God's work, and 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 it, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever really put my whole heart into. And that I feel I belong. Like I I never have to question, do I belong here, or you know, what's the next step? How can we keep growing? Because you know, churches need to open up to this because this is, to me, it's like God came for the hungry, the lonely, the tired, the weary, the, the Mary Magdalene, you know, like it, it, it's in scripture. So this is what harm reduction is, we, you know? So for me, it's been like an amazing journey. Um, I know that Punitive treatment has never worked for me. Tough love has never worked for me. But harm reduction has worked for me. And I just want to also share that people, it's all about love. Meeting someone where they're at is all about love. And, and for me, I want to keep on this, helping, um, being part of the, the the toolkit, being part of every part of it because it's it's made my life whole, and I want to share it with the world. I want I want to continue me bringing in new people, bringing in new people that have changed their lives and sharing it. Thank you, Marilyn. I think I saw um, that Terrell just joined. Yes. Um, good evening, is. everyone. Having technical difficulties up here in the Bronx with this internet, but bear with me. Um, no, I am grateful to be part of the group. You know what I'm saying? Um, And I'm glad I am because of the uh, situations that are happening up here in New York City, you know what I'm saying, with the overdoses, you know, my experience with the um, churches, you know, it really hurted me. But before I get into that, I just want to take a moment of silence for those who died of an unintentional overdose death and those of COVID-19. Thank you. So, um, I know I approached Erica um, a couple of years ago that I had an issue that um, I was doing a Narcan training out on 125th Street. And um, I asked this young lady, would you like to have a Narcan set? And she said, what's that for? And I said, this is this reverse opioid oil for people who do drugs. And the response that she gave me was let the MF die, the drug fiend, drug user. And what bothered me to the fact was that um, I just seen this lady walk out of church and it behooved me that, wow, you just walked out of church, going in, whatever you did in there to talk to Jesus, God, whatever, that's the attitude that you came out with for the, you know, upon giving this information to help somebody live. And I said, yo, we have to do something with this. You know what I'm saying? Um, Faith-based leaders need to be more involved in our community because you need, they need to understand something too, the fact that um, people who use drugs, people who are homeless, people who have mental health issues, they are part of the community. They are part of our community and they need help just as bad as anybody else. You know, I sit there and say to our faith leaders is that um, if your mission is 
to follow Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry. I think we lost Terrell. Um, I hate that because I just uh, love the way that he uh, speaks and ministers in this space. So if, if he's able to join us back again in a minute, we'll be sure to let him finish up. But um, if Katie, if you're willing to hop on in, that would be great. Sure. <clears throat> hey, um, I'm Katie Simon. I'm sex worker liaison for and the leadership team member of Urban Survivors Union, the National Drug Users Union. And I'm also a co-organizer of Whose Corner Is It Anyway, which is a harm reduction, mutual aid, political education, and organizing group in Western Mass, exclusively by and for low-income street and survival sex workers who use stimulants and or opioids and or experience housing insecurity, like Obviously that description was created by committee, sorry. Um, and I've been an opioid using sex worker for 19 years. Um, I'm excited to speak to you today about how religious institutions can be allies in the leadership of drug using sex workers in their communities. I'm going over some of uh, what was in my contribution to the toolkit. And I also just wanna thank, before I start, I wanna thank everyone who's influenced and contributed to my thoughts on community. Um, because this isn't just about my individual thoughts, it's about my brilliant uh, Who's Corner co-organizer, Naomi Lauren, my Who's Corner subcommittee activists, and the amazing loose coalition of drug using sex worker activists and sex worker activists working on the intersection of sex work and drugs, who are the Urban Survivors Union sex worker organizing group. Um, but for the purposes of this panel, it's probably useful to introduce myself again. Um, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool secularist, albeit one from a slightly bizarre religious background. Um, as a teen and a preteen, I was a poor Russian Jewish scholarship kid, uh, an immigrant scholarship kid in a modern Orthodox Jewish high school for the religious Boston Jewish aristocracy. And so this was the kind of place where I got dragged into the principal's office at 13 to discuss my quote heterodox beliefs. Um, where girls had to wear sleeves below their elbows, skirts below their knees, and shirts above their collarbones, where it was a, still a huge controversy that the school allowed girl students to learn Talmud. And I mean, boy, even though I was alienated as all hell, I really did love Talmud. It was really intellectual candy to a precocious kid. Um, Anyway, I got kicked out in my junior year, ostensibly for smoking, but more likely because I was a budding bisexual feminist heretic with mental health issues. Um, afterwards, I was so traumatized by the experience for so many years that it was only intersectionality that saved me from becoming the worst sort of atheist, a la Richard Dawkins. I realized that as a white Ashkenazi Jewish woman, I didn't have the right to evaluate what value religion had for other communities and cultures. But I myself have always been skeptical of religious institutions, and that's why I think I can be helpful in offering some words of critique. Since so many drug using sex workers like me do feel alienated and turned off by religion, coercive religious institutions have given us re traumatizing anti trafficking services, which blame the victim and sometimes go so far as locked doors and restraints. Even the most progressive religious institutions have a tendency to magdalenize sex workers, by which I mean that they can only see us as valid if they frame us as trafficking victims or people in the process of repentance and change into a new life. But religious institutions are so uniquely poised with the sort of political, social, and even cultural capital that can really aid our communities. Okay, I know that I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna break this down into a list of short recommendations. First of all, religious institutions need to focus on the material over the spiritual, over material over mysticism. Radical love and acceptance mean nothing except for, for sentimentality and implicit condescension without real investment in marginalized communities and commitment to systemic change. The sex workers' rights movement is one of the most underfunded movements in the US and drug using sex worker communities are even more impoverished and helping us materially doesn't just mean money, although that's always nice. Um, for example, churches often have a lot of space, halls, huge basements that they rent out for events. I mean, so many churches allow 12-step groups to use these spaces for free. How about allowing non-abstinence-based drug user and sex worker groups to meet there? Just having a space to meet 
can start so much progress in terms of organizing in communities. And what about offering space for wet cot shelters when the weather gets cold? I mean, especially in cities like mine, where there are very few shelter options. And yeah, many churches offer food and clothing, and these are blessings, but harm reduction items need to be a commonplace offering at all religious institutions, as well as sexual and reproductive health offerings, which signal the idea that sex workers are among your community as a given. Also remember, even the poorest sex workers globally are doing mutual aid among themselves informally. Maybe they have an informal collective fund. Maybe they act as security and check in for each other, seeing clients, writing down license plate numbers uh, of cars their friends get into when they do street work. Maybe house community members allow, ha allow houseless street sex working friends somewhere to shower. I mean, see if you can slowly identify the leaders of your sex worker community and see how you can give them resources to expand the work they're already doing and get out of their way. Um, sex workers know best when it comes to what helps sex workers. So that's, so recommendation number two, progressive religious institutions need to move towards radicalism. Even progressive religious institutions enjoy a respectability that few other organizations do. And they need to use that social and cultural capital to move the Overton window leftwards when it comes to drug users and sex workers. There's a history of radicalism within religious institutions that I think we all need to remember and be inspired by. South American churches and convents aiding in, re in revolutions, churches taking decisive stands when it came to civil rights and nuclear disarmament, churches sheltering undocumented immigrants as a form of sanctuary. I mean, I myself am inspired by a cultural Jewish tradition of Marxism and anarchism and anarchist praxis as tikkun olam. Tikkun Olam literally means to repair or heal the world. And that's a dramatic macro project. That's revolution. That's not centrist reform. Um, or to put it in a Christian light, uh, we need you to be Jesus chasing the moneylenders out of the temple in a fierce anti-capitalist intersectional resistance. Religious institutions are uniquely placed culturally to commit acts of civil disobedience and influence the mainstream by doing so. And I'm not advocating for anyone to break the law here, but if say progressive religious institutions committed civil disobedience by opening unsanctioned safe consumption sites, how much more acceptable would it be for more centrist religious institutions to offer harm reduction supplies? I mean, let's not even go as far as breaking the law. Think again about the material advantages many religious institutions take for granted, the buildings and infrastructure you often have. Safer bathrooms proliferating at mosques, synagogues, and churches, especially now when so many houseless drug users and street sex workers have fewer and fewer safe places to use because of COVID lockdowns and stay-at-home advisories would contribute immensely to the health of our communities. Religious workers are some of the few social service providers that aren't necessarily mandated reporters. I mean, how about taking a stand against child protective services, tearing apart the families of poor drug users and sex workers, especially black and brown ones, and offering parents struggling in the drug war resources instead? Okay, and so recommendation number three, you need to learn from drug using sex workers and see us as capable equals. First off, you shouldn't be ministering to sex workers without learning a lot about us from us and gaining cultural competency. For example, I haven't read the whole toolkit yet, but I haven't seen an explainer of how the FOSTA-SESTA legislative package destroyed our indoor street uh, and destroyed our indoor sex work economies and pushed so many of us into the street and into more death, violence, and exploitation, and how COVID-19 is the second huge blow to the in-person sex worker market in two years. There are plenty of things you're not going to understand about our needs and our culture right away, such as our life and death need for confidentiality and how different individuals need that confidentiality to be implemented. I mean, just calling someone by the wrong name in the wrong context can have life-threatening consequences for us. I mean, you probably already have sex worker members in your congregations are using the services you provide, they're just not out to you because maybe it's just not your business, they may or may not trust you, they suffer from internalized stigma. There are so many reasons and you probably aren't ready for them to be out to you yet. I mean, 
For example, how do people in your mosque, shul, or church discuss sex which isn't rep reproductive or monogamous or view the sexuality of women, non-men, LGBT people? How do people in your congregation look at commercial sex? Have speakers used the word, quote, prostitute as a metaphor for corruption and banality in sermons? If religious institutions want to serve and empower sex workers, especially marginalized and drug using sex workers, they also need to compensate sex workers to train them in how best to do so. And speaking of compensating sex workers, how about, yeah, how about, yeah, it hiring, that. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm on my last two sentences, I'm sorry. How about hiring sex workers and drug users as layman workers at your religious institutions or encouraging them to pursue religious leadership? And when I say that, I don't just mean people with lived experience who are in long-term abstinence. I mean, tailoring working environments to active drug users and sex workers so they can use their skills to help your institutions without being set up to fail. And that means hiring people with criminal records. It might mean having other drug users figure out drug life balance with people, juggling issues around retaining the benefits they need, figuring out a way to pay people who might not be banked and who've spent long periods of time just working in black or gray markets. I mean, it's complicated, but if you want inclusive congregations, drug using sex workers shouldn't just be people you serve. We shouldn't just be objects of your charity. We need to be decision makers and contributors to the culture of your religious institutions. I mean, we are experts in emotional labor, just as you are. I think you'll find that you have so much to learn from us as peers. Sorry, the end. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, we're so grateful to have you on. Um, and I wanted to apologize for cutting off Terrell. I thought he dropped off the call, but I believe we still have him here. And I'm so sorry to rush from one person to the other. This is great. I w and um, I hope we'll all take time to digest all the great stuff we're hearing today. All right. No, so there was some technical difficulty here with the internet. Um, but as I was saying, um, you know, I'm trying to understand the position of uh, our faith leaders in our community. Because I don't understand that, you know, if Jesus Christ is supposed to be your religious leader, why aren't you following the step of what he taught? And what he taught is love. And I don't understand why people I come out of your church and not show love in their community if you're supposed to be leading them. The church has to do more in our community. You know, some of these churches I go into, and I see how beautiful they are with gold and everything like this, you know what I'm saying? And I wonder how much that gold piece right there could house somebody. So as I said, I'm so sorry people that you have to go through this, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's been uh, it's crazy. But yeah, the position of the church is you supposed to be giving back and showing love and following the teachings of what your savior has done. And the church is not doing that. Look at the strategy, poverty stricken areas and marginalized communities that the church can help. Because you feed people and you may bed some people, that's not enough. There's more that you can do because look at what Christ did. He didn't come in to save the rich. He came in to save the poor, me, individuals who had addiction problems, who had disease problems, all of that there, you know what I'm saying? And the church is doing nothing. I know they're not doing nothing in my community. Even we have a bunch of sex workers here that need assistance and help, and the church has closed their doors on them. And it's a shame that this is 2020. Things have changed. We have progressed some. And the church still has some of the same stands that it had back in prehistoric days, I'm going to call it. Because I'm being real sarcastic right now. Because it hurts to the fact that as you post to being the leaders of the community, you are not leading. And I understand too that some churches here do have you no know, issues. The Roman Catholic Church have issues. But those things need to be cleaned up. They need to take the lead and follow the, the, the lead of Jesus Christ, who was their leader. And and I can't continue because they keep cutting off over there. Go ahead, man. Move on. Okay. Thanks a lot for that. This is that um, okay. All right. Okay. So, 
we're we're gearing towards the end of um our webinar, but we're gonna um we're gonna leave this space open for questions, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start off with a question um for our panelists. Anyone could feel free to um answer. Um, but how can faith communities show up for marginalized communities? And I know Katie touched on a lot, um, and Terrell spoke a little bit on um, how faith communities should show up, you know, but um, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. And any of our speakers can take that question if you're looking to ask. Yes. Uh, I'll just say briefly that I think showing up is contextual. And so showing up means finding out, as Katie said, like who is already leading in your community um, and asking them what showing up means for them. Um, it's not a universal answer. It means it's relational. It's about tapping into what's already happening among other things. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. I, I wholeheartedly agree that um, faith-based community need to partner up with um Dutch agencies, Peer Network of New York, and go out and see the work that is being done out there. You know what I'm saying? See the pain and agony that um individuals are suffering out there. You know what I'm saying? And hopefully, maybe you know they they may change and, and come aboard and help us do this work. Well, and this is, I mean, that's like really the crux of harm reduction too, right? Like this idea that there's a, a one size fits all solution to things is, it's a really comforting idea to have, but it's not real. Um, and so, you know, just like showing up means different things, depending on the context, harm reduction means different things. It, spiritual practice means these different things, right? So some of that is about um, being able to lean into that relationship that you as faith leaders in your community have with that community, right? Like your folks are gonna tell you how you can show up. And if you can't hear folks tell you how you need to show up, then you're not listening. And that's maybe a, a problem that um, might be a first point of wise reflection, um, you know, without being too prescriptive, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have a quick question about um, sort of a practical application of all of this where, um, you know, I, I'm a heathen and I am in a very, very Christian area. Um, how can I effectively approach the conservative Christian leadership in my area um, effectively? I mean, I could go and yell at them all day, but I would like to effectively approach these people and get, you know, some actual collaboration going where um you know they they hold a lot of power politically and socially here so i you know they're they would be a great asset to to all of the work that i'm doing for advocacy here and i i have no idea how to break into that uh, realm really mm. yeah. wow that's all was that terrell I mean, that's the hard one because, um, you know, like one of the pastors around here that I was having a little issues with is, um, I read some things out the Bible to him, you know, concerning love, passion, treating people with dignity and respect, you know what I'm saying? And I asked him, what was his take on that? You know what I'm saying? It's like, do you believe what's written in the Bible? Because these, this is the word of God. And um, he just looked at me. You know what I'm saying? And um, I just left that in the mind for food for thought. And I think that's what she should do. Just be something about the Bible to them or talk to them something spiritually and leave it for food for thought for them to think about. I mean, it may, it may work and it may not work. Uh, well, a follow-up would be, could you maybe point me in the direction of some scripture that would sort of go with my points? And, you know, I'm sure that we share uh, similar ideas there. 
Yeah, and one of the pieces of the toolkit is that we do have a, again, not comprehensive at all list of uh, references from sacred texts that obviously everything get, gets interpreted in different ways, right? But I think sometimes at least finding some common language to talk with folks about and to say, okay, this is how you may have thought this was interpreted, but here's how it could look different from my perspective. Um, I think sometimes that can be challenging, but sometimes it can be fruitful. But just to speak a little, um, I think I didn't really introduce myself, but I'm in North Carolina. I'm a Methodist pastor. I'm a Southerner, and um, that landscape around harm reduction is, is interesting. Um, but, you know, I, I what I have found is that probably the most effective way to connect with communities of faith is to acknowledge that um, the, you know, the challenges that we're seeing around um, around overdose and uh, around other associated harms with drug use, that they are all over the place. And there are, every community of faith has folks who are affected. Um, and so for me, I hear from other pastors all the time who have had a young person die in their congregation or someone who is struggling or affected in some way. And they're starting to notice that the sort of um, just say no approach is not working like that. They're starting to clue into the fact that the overly simplistic approaches that have been taken for so long um, are not quite working, but they don't they don't necessarily know what other options there are. I see that a lot. And, and really, honestly, like that's my story that um, I, I married a person with a history of substance use and overdose, and that's how I got educated. <laughs> um, but I really thought that there were um, it was very black and white and only two options, either chaos or abstinence. And um, uh, has been a real education for me, but that came through that personal experience and that um, relationship. And I think that's true for communities of faith as well, that when it's impacting folks within the congregation or within the families of people, um, that can become a point where you could, you could say, you know, what are the resources that might help this person? Can you see how our work could support that. So that sometimes can be a good starting point. But thank you for that question. And I'm, gonna, I'm always happy if you want to holler. Um, Ray, who is also on here, is hanging with me in Indiana, um, kind of holding it down with some some old tradition ways. But um, honestly, it's a, it's almost the same way that you approach anybody else, right? Um, so I took it back kind of to, to my traditions and my commitments to my traditions. And, and one of that is to have knowledge before I proceed on things so that I may do them correctly. Um, and, and the other is to make sure that there's um, prudence behind the things that you do, especially how much you give of yourself to anybody else, right? So like my identity spiritually um, and my belief system, sometimes they do or don't come into play with the way that I interact with Christian churches. And of course, there's a very long history, um, especially for my family, uh, that there's some, <laughs> and there's some divide there, um, right? Um, but yeah, it's uh, it can be tricky, but also showing up with authority and agency on what you know that you can speak on, this is a, a respectable thing to do from, from our tradition, but also this is something that I found is respected regardless, right? So there's a, churches are there because they wanna care about people, right? There's a, a at least a little part to start with, and then you just kinda like figure out the rest of it as you bop along. I have a question um, based on, and my name is Enoqua Major and I'm from Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice in the Empire. And this is my first time to this um, sitting and this space. And it has been so eye-opening and powerful for me. My question, along with the young lady that was saying, how do you approach, is the educational component opened my eyes and the stories. And so I'm trying to figure out how do we get this into the churches because um, sex workers had taken over one of the churches um, in our community, and we did the opposite of what you guys are saying to do, you know, putting the gates up, doing all this when we should have had a different approach because of ignorance and misinformation. You tend to do only what you know, but I'm sitting here with my mouth open and searching my heart and soul because this is like a mirror. So I'm thinking that you know, harm reduction training in the churches need to be done and educated because 
for lack of knowledge, as the word say, we perish. And I think, you know, like I said, I thought, you know, giving them food, doing this, letting them shower, but all of those things was like, dang, we should have did some of the things that you guys are talking about. So um, how do we bring the harm reduction education in two places and then setting that boundary when you're working with sex workers and when you're working with people of addictions because i've done it for 15 years as a social worker and it was like you know you take two steps forward you get two steps you know just it, it can be very exhausting work um so i'm just trying to figure out a space to bring what you guys are saying and doing to our community so that we can open these spaces and not judge people because like I said, me being here today, I am just like, I'm happy, but I'm like, oh my God, I need to repent. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that. And I'll just, um, just to say, and then we do need to wrap up because I wanna honor folks time. Um, Faith and Harm Reduction can help with that. We often get requests for folks to just help them troubleshoot and think through what that looks like. Because as we mentioned, a lot of this work is very contextual. And so it depends on where you are and what's going on around you and what local harm reduction efforts we can connect you with. But we're happy to do that. We've been accustomed to putting together little groups of folks to sort of consult with, um, with different communities and harm reductionists around that. So please reach out to us. Um, we do wanna encourage everybody, uh, we have an email list that you can sign up for on our website that will be keeping you abreast of um, upcoming events. Um, including we're hoping to um, kick off a series of office hours regularly in the new year where we'll have sort of a topic each month that we're focused on um, that folks can gather. Um, some of those will probably be regional networking connecting events and some may be topical. And um, we hope that that will be a good chance for folks both to learn and to network with people who are concerned about the same things and can maybe collaborate in the long term. So. Um, Thank you all so much for being with us today. And um, Reverend M. Barkley is going to close us out with a benediction. Thank you. And I do just want to say briefly, Katie, I saw your question in the chat. And yes, 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 yes. And would love to talk more. But yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I am going to share a different uh, benediction than I had intended. I hope that's OK. But this inspired by Jess's comments on chaos um, came to mind. This is a poem from Nikita Gill. Someone is talking to me about the light at the end of the tunnel, and all I can think of is after. What happens after we meet the light, after the grief ends, after we walk into happiness? Won't there be another tunnel, another painful passage, another trauma simply waiting? And the answer is yes, because in the book of being, life promised to be a moving thing. It promised to be both fight and flourish. It vowed to be both lesson and respite. So the love will end, the light will end, the joy will end. And as we keep going, we find it again. So let us keep going together into and out of and into the chaos in true solidarity all the way. Amen. Thank you all. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers and um, thank you to everyone who has uh, joined us today. And we hope that you will continue to connect with the work of Faith and Harm Reduction going forward. Um, have a great night. <laughs>